Hello and welcome. My name's Stephen Dickens and you're joining us here for another Spotlight session from our Mainframe Summit. I'm joined by Eddie Chiliando from 21st Century, or 21 CS as I should say now. Exactly. Hey Eddie, welcome to the show. Hey Stephen, good to be here. So let's dive in. Let's introduce yourself to the listeners and the viewers here. Tell us a little bit about your role and what you do for 21 CS. Yeah, sure. So I get Eddie Chiliando. I'm uh, the Vice President of Strategy at uh, 21CS, again, you know, after rebranding of 21st Century Software, 21CS, we are one of the major uh, software ISVs in the mainframe space, uh, founded in 1992. So we've been around for a while, not as long as the mainframe. So, uh, you know, we just had our 30th anniversary, not the 60th, but again, we've been around for a while. And today I'm coming out of our uh, Boston headquarter. So if you see people running around behind me that's our uh, that's our development team in the background and that looks a great space that's new i think that's good to show directionally where you guys are going great trajectory and growth story i mean tell us a little bit about where you are maybe start there yeah no absolutely and you know i mean one of the things about our office strategy and why we're uh, you know uh acquired or built this new office here in boston is uh, predominantly to attract younger talent Right. I think for I think for our generation, you know, working from home, you know, we've been doing this uh, thing now for a while. Working from home is not an issue, but especially for you know bringing younger talent in, uh, teaching them, giving them kind of a corporate culture, exchanging ideas. I think that's an area where you know having a, an office culture, at least if it's in part office culture, where you have, need to have a fun office, to bring people together to foster that collaboration, you know, foster exchange between perhaps some of the more seasoned developers and some of the younger developers. That, that is uh, one of the reasons why we, you know, had this strategy. So I think we have a pretty attractive office here in Boston, uh, one in New Jersey. Uh, we just recently opened one in Greece. Uh, we have uh, a large uh, facility in uh, Germany, in Stuttgart, where we developed a BSC operating system out of, or BSCN, as it is now called. And then we have our largest center in uh, Perth, Australia, which uh, is also a very nice facility. So if you're ever in, uh, in Perth, then, uh, then let us know. Yeah, a bit better weather maybe than Boston during the winter. Yeah, especially today. We have a we have a northeaster coming through, so we're probably going to see some flooding later. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So you talked about it there. You talked about this transition of the team and the desire to invest in office space to capture that new generation. That gives me a, a perfect segue to maybe talk about some of those architectural choices, some of the sort of where we've come from. We're obviously recording this as part of our 60th anniversary celebration for the platform we're trying not to sort of go back but off camera we were talking about some of those architectural choices that have kind of shaped where the platforms grow yeah yeah and, and, and looking at you know i'm i'm also very much in favor of you know not looking back too much uh i think that's a, a problem that the platform had for for a number of years right where we look back too much and and then again i think a lot of the Again, new talent coming into the platform was kind of shocked though. What, what, what is the system and it's all green screen and then, uh, you know, are, are you still using punch cards? But at, at the same time, I think it's, you know, really important, especially as we celebrate uh, the 60th anniversary of the mainframe. It's, I think it's important to understand some of those key decisions that were made by the IBM Corporation uh, 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 over 60 years ago. A significant investment by Thomas J. Watson Jr. back in the day. I think that's been valued at sort of, what is it, $5 billion if it was today's money. Huge exactly. corporate bet up there with, you know, what we're seeing investment-wise in sort of LLMs and, you know, some of those big strategic acquisitions. That would certainly sort of have been a massive moment at, at, back in the early 60s. Where do you see that in the context of kind of where we are today? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's a good reason why, you know, this investment into the, the System 360 was later known as the $5 billion gamble, right? And, and so, I mean, I think IBM's annual turnover back in the 60s was $2.5 billion. So, you know, they, they invested twice their annual turnover uh, into a new computer architecture design, right? So I think that is, that is pretty significant. And, and you were talking about some of the investments that we see in this day and age uh, i mean yes you know all the big companies are investing into those those uh, large language models and thing 
but we haven't seen any of the big players invest twice their annual revenue into one of those models. And you know, we have to remember, IBM wasn't a startup back in the '60s. They were, uh, they were the biggest player. In, in the industry and for them to say, oh, look, we're going to bet the company on on uh, a system like that. I mean, it's pretty significant. Right? So, yeah, I think a lot of the decisions or, or a lot of the things that we take for granted today, uh, you know, like uh, that a computer hardware architecture is no longer tied to the software, so something that, you know, is completely normal for us today. That was one of the revolutions that the Systems 360 design brought, right? Before that, you had a new app a new application. I mean, obviously those applications were, were uh, uh, much simpler than we see today, but you know, you had a new application, you had to throw out your hardware and vice versa. All right, so I think that was a, a ginormous change, but there was so much innovation, uh, so much deep thought that went into the system, uh, you, you know, that we're still seeing today. And I think one of the reasons why the mainframe is still relevant, is so relevant today, you know, still runs so many critical processes in the global economy is because of some of those decisions that allowed a system to uh, an architecture to stay relevant for 60 years and beyond. Well, I think some of the decoupling that you talked about between the hardware and the software, as you say, everybody kind of expects that today. But that's the reason why organizations like 21CS are allowed to exist. That And why you've got control of the VSEN operating system has been decoupled from IBM. I mean, the sort of some of those architectural decisions made back then enable ISVs like Twenty One CS to even exist. Oh yeah, no, no, you're spot on. I, I would even go as far as to say, you know, the Systems Three Hundred and Sixty created the computer software market, right? Because before it was it was a hardware market. Right. Again, if you wanted a new application, you had to build a new hardware, acquire new hardware, and and, and code for that new hardware. Right? So it was really that that decoupling that you just mentioned, Stephen, that that, that created a, uh, a a true software market for for players like Twenty One CS. You're right. So we'll wind forward enough of the trip down history lane. Kind of where do you see the platform going forward? Obviously. Lots of debate over the years about the relevance of the platform. I think we're largely past that now. It's interesting as I look at the industry, people are looking at custom silicon again, different architectural choices for different workloads. The mainframe just fits in that whole rubric for me as we're looking at different silicon for AI workloads. We're looking at different silicon for transactional workloads. Where do you see the platform going forward? I'm always fascinated when we... Chat, I think you've got one of the best sort of strategic, long-term thinking views of the platform. Where do you see it going? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think there, there's a lot to unpack there, right? You mentioned a couple of things, right? The, again, custom silicon uh, integration of uh, components, right? I think for, for a long time, I would say probably for the past, what is it, 20, 30 years, there was you know this notion of, of a decoupling of scale out Right, and I would I would argue that the cloud is probably the ultimate scale out architecture out there, right? Where mm -hmm. you know you need you need a couple more web servers, no problem. You know you you have another instance in, in whatever cloud provider you're using, but that model also showing uh, limitations limitations for workloads, limitations. I was just at the at the conference a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about you know some of those AI accelerators, where they simply can't get enough electricity. And uh, conversely, also not enough cooling into the system to power uh, those environments, right? And there was, you know, there was a future prediction that we have to get water cooling back in the data center. I had to chuckle, right? Because obviously, <laughs> in the mainframe space, we are uh, somewhat uh, somewhat familiar with uh, liquid cooled machines, right? Somewhat familiar being the op operative words there, I think. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, so I think there's there's a lot of use cases that. The mainframe shines today and will shine in the future, right? Because if, if you look at the market out there, how many truly integrated and, and uh, uh, machines that are out there that scale vertically, right? Again, I think that the architectural choice, as I said, for the past 30 years has been kind of scale out architectures, which is great. It works for a lot of things, right? If you have your, your social media pages, you have, uh, again, you have your web service, you have your online shopping, all of those use cases work in a scale-out model, but then there's other use cases 
where you need to have that central instance of truth, that central instance of a database, and you need to have sub-second response time. I mean, again, airline reservations, uh, you know, online banking, credit card processing. You don't want to be into queue, you know, swipe your credit card and then wait for a minute or two. Right? That that simply doesn't fly. Or even worse, you know, you 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 swipe your credit card and every time you swipe, you get a different result. Well, hopefully the result is in your favor, right? But I mean, transactional integrity is is absolutely crucial for some workloads, right? And that requirement, I don't see that requirement going away anytime soon. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I think it, the transactional piece, but also just that security piece for me is is important. We see, you know, the crown jewels of your PII, your personal identifying information, your credit card, your social security number, your passport information. Or typically, that tends to be held in these systems of record. That's where the mainframe, for me, plays a role, and I don't see that role changing. Oh yeah, and and, and I mean, look, I think there doesn't, I think there's not a week going by where we don't see a major cyber attack, right? And so far, I mean, knocking on wood, none of those attacks uh, has impacted the the mainframe, at least to my knowledge, mm-hmm. uh, right? So I think that uh, the mainframe does have a great track record, and and you know the importance of safeguarding your customers' information. Uh, Yes, it's only getting more important, right? I mean, we've uh, witnessed with the, the launch of IBM C16, you know, the importance of quantum quantum safe. And even though that's still a couple of years out, you know, mm-hmm. we know it's coming. And there you have a system that is already addressing that future risk today. So it just shows, I think in the mainframe world, you know, again, looking back 60 years, looking into future 60 years, a lot of the decisions I think that were made sometimes were a little slower Right, uh, we didn't adopt all the latest and greatest hype technology in the mainframe, uh, and oftentimes, again, you know, we were laughed upon uh, sometimes by people. Why are those guys still running 31 bit? I, I remember, you know, when I joined, uh, all the Unix guys were, were making fun of me because again, we had this 31 uh, bit thing, but it was there for a good reason, right? To have that backward compa- compatibility. So a lot of decisions that were made, you know, were not just for okay, what's what's cool right now. But what do we see being meaningful in the future? And again, you know, tying it back to our software development, right? We have to make a lot of decisions now around modernization. Well, you know, taking a take an example of user interfaces, right? If, if you if you talk to ten experts, you probably get fifteen answers. What's the coolest and hippest user interface right now? And we could probably pick each one of those user user interfaces uh, today for our product, and it would be cool this year. But next year, you know, there might be something else that is cool and, and the year after, right? So we have to make sure we make very thoughtful decisions when we change something, uh, not just for right now, you know, what is the, the, the coolest thing right now, but also, you know, what is sustainable for the next couple of decades. And, I mean, we've done a great job for the first sort of 10 or so minutes here talking about the platform and its context. Where does 21CS play in that overall landscape? Because... Obviously, you've taken over VSC and made that VSCN. There's some other acquisitions, the organization. We've talked about the office space. See you on a trajectory of explosive growth as a software vendor in the space. Where do you see your kind of role in the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So uh, I I think one of our priorities has been, again, sustainability. And Mm -hmm. what I mean sustainability, what I mean by that is have a you know, sustainable workforce for the future so that we have a pipeline of, of skilled people coming and joining uh, 21CS and then helping us develop uh, the future of, of mainframe software products. I think that is uh, that is a key thing for us that we live internally, right? So I think, um, I don't even know how many people, how many university graduates we hired last year, but it was uh, was a quite sizable number. I think in Australia alone, it was 15 people we hire a lot of people here in the us again in germany in greece right so we do it internally uh, Mm -hmm. hiring uh, new talent Mm -hmm. uh, educating the new talent so we have different education programs across the company where we take people through but uh lately we have also started to expand you know kind of expand that and expand it into the ecosystem right so for instance you may have heard about uh the the mainframe or mainframe skills council that was launched at the 
the share in Spring, mm -hmm. uh, where we are one of the founding members, right? So we want to share our experiences that we are having, you know, with bringing people into the company, bringing new people into the mainframe ecosystems, training them. We want to share that experience now with, with the rest of the ecosystem. And where do you see sort of some of those foundational 21 CS solutions playing a role? We talked about VSEN, obviously a lot of sort of foundational tools that you guys provide. Where do you kind of see the, the sort of solution portfolio going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, at the, when I look at our current solutions, and what we're bringing out, and obviously I, I can't talk too much about uh, about future. Well, go on, Andy. We we, we <laughs> wanted to break NDA and tell the team and the listeners here. Exactly, but I can give you a directional uh, idea of where we're heading, right? So I think currently we're very strong in the whole data resilience piece. Data mm -hmm. resilience uh, has, you know, as you know, is such an important topic. Has always been an important topic on the mainframe, but uh, you know, it continues to increase in importance. So you will see our portfolio in that space just increasing uh, to make it easier, more comprehensive to protect your data on a mainframe. Mm -hmm. I think that is, that is one key area. Uh, the other key area that we see, in, and you've seen it with uh, the product that uh, we with IBM launched at the end of last year, Cloud Data Manager, we're definitely going into that whole, or are already in that hybrid cloud space, and you will only see that increase, right? Because just like the mainframe is here to stay, I think the cloud, cloud architecture is here to stay as well, right? So we have to make sure that the, the mainframe is an integral part of any hybrid cloud architecture, right? And, and that those two coexist for me. It's not a either or, it's a both and for me. You've got to have those two coexist. I know, you're spot on. And, and you know, I think a lot of the, the people are listening or, or watching this and you know, have been in the in the mainframe world for a bit, re may, may remember that that notion of fit for purpose, right? fit for purpose platform. And too often I, I see we in IT having religious debates. You know, I want to be on Unix, I want to be on Linux, I want to be on whatever, just because I think it's the coolest platform. Well, that really shouldn't be the decision, right? I mean, we are, you know, this, this is an industry, right? So you should make business decisions. So make your decisions based on, on uh, you know, the best platform for the purpose. And again, I think the cloud has helped uh, with a, a lot of that maturity where, you know, we took that whole platform discussion. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what's running underneath AWS, what operating system, and I personally don't really care. Same way as Azure or some of the other cloud platforms. I just want to have an environment to run my workloads. And, and the same thing with the mainframe. Well, you don't really have to care if, if there's ZOS running on, on, on that box. You just want to have the most secure platform with the highest transactional integrity, highest transaction throughput for, for certain workloads. So as we start to bring this home here, Eddie, please for me, if you would, break this down to the three takeaways. I'll give you a, a sort of backward looking present day and a future takeaway, if you would. Just break, maybe give, it, give me those three takeaways and, and of where you see the mainframe. So I think the backward looking one is, is again, you know, remember those key strategic decisions that were made and how important that they are for today and for the success today. Right? I think the mainframe would have gone the same way as a lot of other platforms. And, and you know, you and I, we've seen a lot of cool systems out there over the decades that simply don't exist anymore. Mm hmm. Right. And the reason why the mainframe is still around is because of some of those decisions, right? That make the platform long viable for the long term. Right. And a lot of the decisions that we have to make today are again so that you know our software, the, the system design will it will be viable for the next 60 years. Right. So that's kind of backward looking. Those strategic decisions, those architectural decisions, sometimes they may may have looked a little funny. Again, like my uh, uh, 31 bit example, but it was for a good reason so that we could have backward comp compatibility with some of the 24 bit architectures back in the day, right? So mm -hmm. those are key decisions. Now, in the present, I think that the key takeaway there is to make sure that, you know, again, the mainframe is here to stay, your cloud is here to stay. So make sure you integrate those architectures, have a strategy that is all encompassing, not just, okay, you know, Mike. And you and I would probably hear it 
every day. My strategy is cloud first. I only want to go cloud. And, and you know, the mainframe is in a contained corner. I think that is fundamentally wrong, right? Because mm -hmm. like both architectures, both designs have their places, we just outlined. And you want to make sure that you use the right architecture for 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 for, for your workloads. Right? So I think that's from a press perspective. And then forward looking, right? In order to make the system viable for the next 60 years, again, we have to make very smart architectural decisions with uh, you know what we uh, bring to the platform. Uh, uh, so again, that you know the platform is viable for the next six years. That we open it up, I think that's very important. Open it up, things like API, and make it more like all the other systems. Right? I mean, one of my challenges when I started in the mainframe space in, in the late uh, late 90s was that this system was so completely different than anything else. You know, there was no file system. There were data sets, there were track cylinders. There was this strange ISPF interface. There was no cluster. There was a coupling facility, right? I think we, we have collectively as an ecosystem do a better job of just making the mainframe just in our platform, in your IT architecture, right? To make it easy, make it consumable. I think that's our task for, for, uh, for today and into the future. And then forward looking, uh, you know, my recommendation or my key takeaway will probably be less of the technology piece, but more of what are we doing to attract talent, right? Because we can have the best system design, uh, you know, best technology. If we don't have the skills anymore on the platform to develop, to maintain uh, uh, mainframe systems in the next six years, then we'll all have fundamentally failed, right? And that's why it is so key me personally, but more importantly to 21CS, that we make sure that we attract uh, new talent to, to keep the, the platform viable for the next 60 years. And we've seen so much of that talent walking behind you, Eddie. I don't know whether you've been able to see your screen, but really great to see such a vibrant environment and, and 21CS thriving. Appreciate you being on the show. Appreciate you sponsoring the Mainframe Mini Summit here at Future. That was my pleasure. And uh, again, happy birthday, Systems 360. So you've been watching another Spotlight session at the Mainframe Mini Summit. Check out the other sessions, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for watching.